Let's pray before we come to the Word. We're going to conclude the series we've been doing on marriage today, this morning, and again this evening. This evening will be the last message. And God, I thank you that you have not left us without a word. You've not left us uninformed or uneducated, but you have told us very clearly how to enjoy our marriages. You've told us as men how to lead, how to pray in our homes. You've told us as women how to be good wives. And I, I, I beg you, Lord Jesus, that we would not just be hearers, but we would be doers of the precious word. We would be doers of these things. And God, I ask you for grace on me personally in every area that we've looked at. Grace on my wife to fulfill her calling in this way. Grace on every couple in this church and all those listening by radio. And grace on every single person that they will not go the way of the world, but they will have been informed about the truths of God and they will gain wisdom through these things. So we commit today, this morning and this evening, as we conclude this, Lord, cement it into our spirits, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to Genesis chapter 16. This is my favorite scripture when talking about any woman in the Bible. I think it's a fantastic scripture. We've spent weeks talking about men, and today we're going to shift our focus to the woman. Genesis chapter 16. As I say, I, I think it's the most beautiful of scriptures for women. Genesis 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai ill-treated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now with child, and you will have a son. You will name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. He will live in hostility towards all his brothers. So she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well is called Bir Laharoi, and it is still there between Kadesh and Bered. I think that's absolutely fantastic, and it's expansive in the, the, the people it can reach. As I say, this is our last Sunday looking at this series. And just to, a reminder to you, who's this series for? I'll tell you who it's for. It's for single men and women. Because if you're single, statistics are showing us that all over the world, relationships are not lasting. And the statistics are falling in the church and outside ever increasingly in the church. People don't seem to be able to hold it together anymore. Marriage is breaking up. And one of the problems, if you're single, is that we decide we're going to get married in five weeks' time. And then it's cramming. It's a six-week marriage course or something. We spend more time preparing for a holiday 
than we do preparing for the biggest commitment you're ever going to make in your life. It's ludicrous. So this is a series for those of you who are single to really listen with all your heart. Get smart and prepare for life. It's a series for those who are married just to help you with the everyday struggles. Every marriage has struggles, friends. Every marriage has struggles. Anybody tells you they don't? Well, sorry, I don't believe you. And it's a series for all disciples. You know, the Bible says this. The older women in the church should teach the younger women. How are you going to do that? What are you going to teach them about? What's relevant about what you're going to bring to them? And that's exactly what this series is guiding us to do. You know what the young women are going to ask you about? What we mentioned last week. Virginity. And if you're going to be relevant to those young women, then this is exactly what they need. But as a discipler, it's exactly what you need. So back to Hagar. I think she's a fascinating example of womanhood, womankind. Do you know why? Because as I see her, she, is, she feels invisible. She, she's been abused, misused, ill-treated, cast out. And I think it's the invisible woman instead of the invisible man, right? And I, I, I think that because of what the name she gave God. What was the name she gave God? I have found the God who can see me. So God obviously put an impression on Hagar. I can see you. Even if nobody else can see you. I can see you crying, Hagar. You may have been ill-treated at home, but I can see you. So don't fret. Don't fear. And that to me, you know, just really does exemplify so many, you know, female lives. The lives of so many women for a thousand reasons can feel ignored, abused, misused, and invisible. Now, as I've said several times to you, the premise of the scriptures is very clear, and it's this. If you can get the men right, you'll get the women right. If you can get the men right, you will get the churches right. If you can get the men right, you'll get, you know, the whole family will be okay. So that's why we have really been heavy on the men, because that's how I read the Bible. Four times more, right? But today we're going to shift and look at the women. Well done, Gordon. Good timing on your return. All the men's stuff out of the way. Got Helen back here for the women's stuff. Amen. Hagar reminds me, as I say, of women who lose their identity. Now, let me ask you a question, ladies. How's your identity going? How do you feel about yourself? How do you see yourself? One of the, we have a lot of career women here, and I am wholeheartedly with you, wholeheartedly with you. I understand the career, maybe a bit better than you do. And I say that because I've dealt with hundreds of women and men in careers, whereas you only deal with your own. So I've had a lot more experience than you at dealing with careers. I see the good and the evil. I see the damage and the great blessing. For example, so, Hagar, a bit confused, are you? So, lady, a bit confused about your identity, is it? A bit frustrated. No matter what I do, I don't seem to be happy. Not happy in my marriage, not happy with my kids. I thought they'd make me happy, but I'm still not happy. And so many women find this identity crisis, this identity trap. Well, wind the clock back, folks. Go to Genesis. What did it say in Genesis? Here's Adam. And Eve came as a helpmeet to him. There's your identity. There's your identity. It's your first identity was to help the man to achieve his goal. That's the biblical model. That is also the traditional model. But guess what? Guess what happened in the 1920s with the liberation movement? Guess what happened in the 1960s? An identity crisis. And now all of a sudden, you've not just got Adam pursuing his career, now you've got the woman pursuing her career and enter the identity crisis. So the woman doesn't know which way she's going. And all I'm saying is, there's no problem with a career. But there's a big problem if you don't come down the biblical road all the more because you understand these things. So modern-day women do have problems with these things. Definitely. Praise God for the Bible. Relevant in every generation. So God sees Hagar. She has this identity crisis, if you like. She feels abused, misused, and definitely invisible. 
And that what we see him do to her is this. He changes her perspective on her own circumstance. And he sort of says, hey, hey, God, cheer up. Take a fresh look at what you've got. Take another look at your life. You see that child in your womb? He's going to be a mighty child. That's where all the Arabic people came from. It's where the oil was. I'm going to bless him. I'm going to bless him so much. You wouldn't believe it, Hagar. Look again at your situation. Think again. And it's point one. I believe what God said to Hagar is, learn to seize the opportunity that I have put before you. Could I have a, a notes for today? I seem to have lost mine somewhere. Seize the opportunity. Thank you. Seize the opportunity that is before you. And I think that if, if there was one word for you ladies to take home, it would be that. Look at your marriage with fresh eyes. Look at your life with fresh eyes. And I, I, I don't believe we do, you see. I think we can't see the forest for the trees sometime. I, I was overseeing a church once. Listen to this. It was a young pastor. He didn't have a lot of experience. Maybe you've got a young husband. Maybe he's still learning. It was a young pastor. He didn't have a lot of experience. A young man trying to find his way. And he had a reasonably sized church. But the people soon got fed up with him. He was making too many mistakes. And they began to call me up, began to visit us and say, look, we're not happy with our pastor. And I went down and, and saw what the guy was doing. He was trying his best. And I remember getting a group of the people together, couples that had been complaining, saying, sit down, everybody. I want to talk to you. Complain, complain, complain about your pastor. Can you not see an opportunity here? Can you not see what I can see? I see a young man who's very keen. He doesn't have a lot of experience. And you who are older in the Lord should help him, should back him, should be with him. Can't you see the opportunity you have as a church member to build? The fools out there, the lost, they can tear down. Amen. But in the house of God, surely you should be different. Can't you see? And you know what, folks? They did not see. They did not see. And I meet many a woman who cannot see anymore her own husband. She has set her opinion of who he is or who he ever will be. And you can't get in. And I believe God wanted Hagar. Look again, Hagar, at your life. Because it's not actually as negative as you think. Now, we need to start from where we're at. I don't know if you've heard the Irish joke. I shouldn't tell Irish jokes, but I'm allowed to because I'm Irish. There's an Englishman driving down the road, you know, in Ireland, and he's lost, and he pulls over, and he stops this Irish guy, and he says, do you know the way to Dublin? And the Irish guy, of course, says, well, I wouldn't start from here if I was you. That's a joke. Laugh. Come on. <laughs> I wouldn't start from here if I was you. Well, that's a crazy thing to say, isn't it? Because you are who you are. You can't change it. And I think Hagar needed to look at that as well. Do you know who your husband is? Your husband. He's the one you've got. And you know who your wife is? She's the one you've got. It, you aren't somewhere else. That's exactly where you are. So take a fresh look at it. The day has to come where you make a decision that you are going to make the best out of your relationship. You can say amen. Amen. The day has to come where you say, I am going to get the best out of my marriage. I'm going to see the best in my partner. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hope for the best in them. And I'm going to advance my marriage. Now listen, every wife has limitations. Every husband has limitations. And you're going to have to accept them too. Your husband's not perfect, ladies. He's not perfect. Your wife's not perfect. And you're going to have to accept those limitations. Limitations spiritually. Listen to me. Your husband has limitations spiritually. Your husband has limitations soulishly in the way he can be your friend. Your husband has limitations sexually. So you need to get with it. The man you've got is the one you've got. That's it. And I think Hagar, God wanted Hagar to see who she actually was, where she was, to take a fresh look at her life, not to focus on the negative. You know, every person has redeeming factors. And women, you know what you can do? You could go home this afternoon and get a blank sheet and write down the, the top 10 redeeming factors, the, the, you know, the good things that you see in your husband. Five then, five redeeming factors. Four. 
Write down the best things that you see in him because they are there, right? They are there. The lost can see negative. But as I say, we are saved. You know, treasure that opportunity of your salvation and see through the eyes of the Spirit. And I would say to you this, you need to support your husband when he's getting it right. But my oh my, you need to support your husband when he's getting it wrong. And what a, what a travesty, what a betrayal to, to let the person down who you've married when they start to get it wrong. And he will. A thousand times he will get it wrong. But your husband actually needs you, woman, when he's failing so much more than he ever needs you when he's getting it right. It's very like church members. Church members that support the church when it's going well, hallelujah. <laughs> That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for those who will go through the hard times. Amen. And stick with it. That's what we're looking for. You know, again, another pastoral issue. I got a phone call one day from a church, and they said, you better get in here. Pastor's just, I won't tell you what he did. <laughs> Pastor's just blowing it big time. Get in here. Trouble. And it was trouble. That is potential church split, you know. So I drive in, I go to the church, I get there, and there's a bunch of men standing around the pastor, and he's like a whip dog, you know. I thought, what have you been saying to him? And they expected me to come in and rebuke, and I didn't. I went in, and I quietly said in front of them so they could hear, what happened? Did you make a mistake? Yeah, I know, I've done loads of mistakes. What's wrong with you guys? And there was tension and silence. Oh, you want me Pharisees, is it? You want me? No, 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 no. Get on with your work. Go on. Get away. And I, I dealt with that man, my man, who made a mistake very gently, very tenderly. And then when all the people had gone, I got him in the office and I said, what are you doing? You're crazy. I did. But not publicly. He needed to know his mistake. I thought, you're mad for doing that. But never mind. It's okay now. And so you should be with your man. You need to be very respectful, especially in public. Especially in public. Paul says, you know, if the, if the woman has anything to say, wait until you get home. Amen. Don't demean your husband in public ever. If you have some correction to make, fine. But wait until you get home, girl. Because you're going to mess up that relationship big time. So very simply, whoever you are, whatever your situation is, that's the situation you've got right? That's the situation you've got. That's your husband. Get used to it. Start to make the best of him, the best out of every situation. That's what a woman must do, step one. Secondly, every woman must learn the graceful art of submission, and that is exactly what it is. It is a learned, you know, trait. It is a learned way. In Philippians, God calls it an attitude, an attitude within you, and every woman should do this. Listen to me. I don't know what's more ugly on earth than an insubmissive woman. It destroys her. It takes all her beauty away. And I don't think there's anything more beautiful on the earth than a woman who has learned the graceful art of submission. She's right where she was made to be. She can be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, it's not natural to be submissive, it's not natural for the ground to produce flowers, right, but weeds. And it's natural for us to be rebellious. That's just the old nature. That's your flesh coming through. But we're not natural in that sense, are we? We have a spirit. And the spirit rules our souls. So we don't react soulishly. We live out of the spirit. And a key part, listen girls, a key part for the joy in a woman's life is submission. Sorry, you can't take it away. You can't change it. You must learn that or you will never be happy. Don't be a Jezebel. Are there any Jezebels here this morning? <laughs> You're not in a rush to put your hand up. Look at, Gordon, did you just nudge her then? No? Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry, picking on you. But seriously, let me ask the question again, but this time really don't put your hand up. Are there any Jezebels here? Are there any Jezebels here? Do you know what a Jezebel is? We're not going to cover it today. We already have. A Jezebel is a strong woman. Strong women like to marry weak men. What ha who did Jezebel marry? Ahab, weak man. What did Jezebel do? 
dominated her husband. Then what did she do? Try to dominate the church. She came after Elijah. And it's the same pattern. Don't take that road, ladies. Don't take that road. It's all through your Bible. It ends in disaster. That's the world's way. That's rebellion. And that's straight out of the Garden of Eden. Don't do that. Instead, do what the Bible says. And make it your journey to be a submissive woman. Now, the next question you will get asked is, what am I supposed to submit to? You know, what's right and what's wrong? Well, the answer is the same. Like with God, you submit to all things that God says, right? And with your husband, you submit to all things except sin. All things except sin. And many people have brought this issue, you know, how do I submit, what do I submit? All things. Just keep it nice and simple. And I, I call it the paint the door example. Like say, when I left school, I did nearly a year full time with a painter and decorator, a professional. And I worked alongside him and he taught me a little bit, you learn quite a bit in that time, about painting and decorating. Now, if my overseer, who's Shane Comiskey, right? If Shane comes here next week and he says, Mike, I want you to, to, to paint that door. Now, I already know some things. For instance, if you're going to paint a door, don't start at the top. Start at the bottom. If you start at the top, you end up with runs all through your paintwork. You're making hard work for yourself, etc., etc. So Shane says to me, he's my overseer. I've got to be submissive. He says, paint that door. But what I want you to do is I want you to start at the top. Oh. Huh. Yes? Shane, could I make, just make a comment? You're better off starting at the bottom. I'm perfectly within my rights to do that. And Shane says, no, I tell you what I want you to do. Do exactly what I'm saying. Start at the top. Now tell me, what's the right way to paint the door? You shouldn't have to think about that one. <laughs> There's only one right way, and that's his way. There's only one right way. And that's the way I'm being told. I may think I know better. It doesn't matter. You may be right. It doesn't matter. There's only one right way to do that. In fact, there's a thousand ways you could paint the door. But the right way to paint it is the way you've been told to paint it. And if only we could get that little bit into our, you know, mechanisms of everyday life, you would be much happier. Do you know this very same thing happened to the Apostle Peter? Expert fisherman. And he's out fishing. And he's fished all night. And he's caught nothing. And what happens is he begins to pull his nets and he's going to go home. And what happened? Jesus says to him, cast your net on the other side. And Peter says, look, Jesus, we've been fishing all night. It's not going to work. You're a carpenter, Jesus. This is my area. That's yours. And Jesus has already given the command. I want you to cast your net on the other side. And I love what Peter said. Okay. I'm good at this. This is what I do for a living. I'm a fisherman. But because you say, I will do exactly that. And there comes his blessing. And God will test you because you may think you know better. And until you get over that hurdle, your life will be a constant struggle within the home or even as a single person in work, in college, with your parents or whatever. Always thinking you know better. But actually, whether you're right or wrong is irrelevant. What's relevant is developing a submissive spirit. So ladies, seize the opportunity of the man that God has given you and make a commitment to, to, to do the best within your marriage. Secondly, learn that, that graceful art, and it is a learned art of submission. And thirdly, develop the nature of a servant. Now, in, again, in Philippians, it covers these things in chapter 3. Very good. And I think the nature of a servant is a perfect way to put it. You see, look at me a moment. There's two ways you can, for example, give your husband his dinner. I used to go to this house, right, regularly, like 10 times or something, years ago. And the wife in that house used to cook dinner for me and for her husband. And she would get the two plates and she would come out. We would be sitting at the table and she would walk in, slap. You think, Ooh. and the attitude, servant nature, I don't think so. She was an excellent cook, absolutely excellent. And you know what? I never enjoyed a morsel in that house. 
I never enjoyed my dinner. I had to choke the thing down because she would come in and say, there's your dinner. I hope you don't think I'm going to be taking these plates away in a minute. You can get them in there yourself. Spoiling the atmosphere. You see, servanthood is not actions. Remember, some of the most faithful you know, people in the church are the most rebellious. Servanthood is not just about actions. That lady was doing the actions, but she didn't have the nature. She didn't have the nature of a servant. You see, and within any home, that's what's beautiful in a home. When the mother, when the wife is actually serving out of her heart. And many times I left that house and I would go home to Jeanette. And do you know what I would say to her? A crust of dry bread that you give me is nicer than the finest affair in that home. Let's pray for them. Let's pray that God would change that woman from that. That's a terrible attitude to have within. She's not. Do you know the trouble in that house? There was two men. That was the problem. One of them's wearing a skirt, you know. <laughs> there was two men in the home. And there was nothing wrong with that husband. He was a good guy. It was just a rebellious woman. It was someone who'd never changed from like the day she got married. She was still the same independent type. And that's a terrible thing. That's not what you were made for. That's not that woman of Genesis. You've lost your identity. You don't know who you are anymore. And it's made you, boom, unhappy. You know, don't play the victim. You know, it's the easiest thing in the world for a woman to play the victim, to always feel you're being put upon. Hagar. It's the easiest thing in the world. And God needs to change your mind at some point of your life and grow up and see things differently and see you've got a Savior who can support you and help you. So these are... Could we come back, please? These are very simple steps, but very important steps for you to take. Number one, seize the opportunity of your marriage. Don't let it slip by. And I'm serious about that. I want you to look again at your husband. Secondly, learn to be submissive. You assess yourself. You know if you're submissive or not. And the scriptures are very clear. Be submissive in all things. Be a servant, but not just in actions. Household after household. Don't I do the housework? Don't I do that? Don't I? Don't I? Actions, my dear. Actions. And there's no beauty in that. It's the nature that brings the beauty. Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, took on the nature of a servant and came among us. That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. And that is particularly the role of the woman in a home. Particularly to be a good mom, a good wife to your husband. I was sharing with the leaders just a few weeks ago. Do you know when you die, if you're born again, when you die, you'll go before the Lord. And there's going to be a thing called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you'll be sitting there. I don't know how this is going to work because we're all going to be there. But what's going to happen is Jesus Christ, we have a man in heaven. Jesus Christ is obviously going to come out and he's going to go, Paul, and Jesus is going to serve you. And then he's going to go, I'm Becky. And he's going to serve you. Elsa, you see? Now, tell me, why would the king of kings do that? Because it's in his nature. It's in his nature. He took on the nature, and it's the most natural thing for him to do. There's no rebellion there. There's no pride there. And this is the, the beautiful, beautiful nature of womanhood and how it's been corrupted. Hey, girl, girls, listen, pursue your career. Not a problem. Go right ahead. I think God will be right with you. All I'm saying is don't counterbalance. Keep the balance of biblical ethics. Keep the balance of biblical qualities that a woman should have. And I don't care if you're the super international galactic managing director of goodness knows what. Carry on and be that. But listen, do you know when you go home, do you know what you are there? You're a mother and you are a wife. And you can leave your title at the door or you're never going to have a happy house. And all the men said, <laughs> seize the opportunity. 
Learn the graceful art of submission. Learn the nature. Take on the nature of a servant. And lastly, is there any reward for this? I do all this. And what, you know, what's in this for me, if you like? Well, there's an awful lot. For a start, there's joy. Right? The woman, in my opinion, she gets the joy. But only when she's fulfilling these conditions. You can always tell a happy wife. Very, 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 very easily. It's as plain as a billboard. Very clear to see. And then you know whether that woman is serving in the home, submissive to her husband. That's where the joy comes from. That's where the joy comes from. Hebrews, you have anointed me with the oil of joy because I was obedient to you, Father. The oil of joy, the reward for submission, the reward for servanthood is that the woman becomes, she finds her identity, finds her DNA, and becomes the wife, the mother, the, uh, the, the woman that God has made her to be. Your reward is joy, but it's also influence. Now, influence is not position. Womankind lost their position in the Garden of Eden. That was the punishment for sin. Because Eve sinned, she was demoted. Right? Remember, we've been through it a thousand times. Your desire will be to rule over him, but I'm changing the order. He will rule over you. It's not position that is your reward in this life, and it never will be in this life. The reward is something very different. It's influence. Influence within the home. And that is a lovely thing for a woman. So here's that man pursuing his goal. But when you know that you're respected, you're not invisible, you're treated well, if you like, in that relationship, you can begin to exercise the Ezer Connecto. You can begin to exercise the thing that you were made for. And that's where you get your fulfillment. I'll cover this tonight. That's where the woman finds her fulfillment. In influencing, God's given women a particular kind of wisdom that the men need to listen to, right? And you, you, you'll be frustrated until you've, you're able to receive, that your husband is able to receive that. So your reward for being a godly wife is joy. Your reward is that you have influence over that man. A bit like Mary. Remember Mary came to Jesus and she said, we've run out of wine at the wedding, would you do this? And Jesus said, my time has not yet come. Yet because of her nature, because of her servanthood, if you like, Jesus granted that miracle. Remember the woman, the Gentile woman, her daughter had a demon and she cried out to Jesus. The same thing. She had influence over him. And that's what you gain within your home. And that will bring you actually closer and closer together. It's been a hard time for the men over the last few weeks. I know. You've been very good, very patient. But we're, 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 we're nearly done. One more time together, and that's tonight. And after that, actually, if you turn over your notes, I'll show you what we're going to do tonight, this evening. We're going to look at God's A plan. And with this, we're going to send you couples home and send you singles home to keep it. Pastor Tom will pick up some of these points in the weeks and months to come. But if we could only fulfill our marriage vows, things would be a lot happier. Do you know what a vow is? Most people don't know what a vow is. A promise is a promise between two people. I can promise you something. A vow is when you make a promise to God. That's what a vow is. And on your wedding day, you stand with this person and you promise God that I am going to do A, in this case, A, A, all the way down. This, these are the things that will hold my marriage together. Remember, love will never keep a marriage together. It's not what it's for. It's commitment. Lifelong commitment to the operation of these things. And we'll look at them tonight. But maybe now would be a good time for us. Maybe Pastor Tom, if you, just where you are, if you could pray a prayer over the couples of the church. And let's stand. I'll invite the worship team back. Just close your eyes as Pastor Tom prepares himself. Just close your eyes a moment, singles. Close your eyes, couples. And God, I repeat that we have not been left without the guidance we need. We have had it loud and clear. And I pray you'll add to us the wisdom to see it through. God, help us. Bless us. Make us wise in all these ways. Let us take these things home. 
And may they bless our homes, bless our families. In Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to today's program. I trust you have been blessed and edified by what you've heard. I want to ask you to do something, and that is to become a partner with us here at Preparing the Way. By doing so, you can help us to take these essential messages out to many other nations, many other people around the world. You can become a partner by visiting our website, preparingtheway.tv, and there you will find many ways that you can join up. Folks, it is a pleasure and an honor to partner with you in bringing in the end times harvest. God bless you, and once again, thank you for listening.